Watch me, and then try it yourself. I know. There have been plenty of Half-Life retrospectives and reviews in the 22 years since the game was originally released. The internet doesn't need any more of them, so this isn't a review. I'm not going to do an investigative deep dive into the development of the game or try to convince you of some grand conspiracy theory. I'm not even going to talk about how this game series influenced my journey from console to PC gamer. There are plenty of great videos doing all of those things all over YouTube. In fact, I'm going to put some of my favorites in the doobly-doo so you can check them out as well. No, this video exists mostly because I need something to hold me over while I wait for Half-Life Alex to release on March 23rd. I'll definitely be doing a Let's Play or something when that comes around. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. For now, join me as we get into some of the lore of Half-Life, go over each level's plot, and see how the world building in this game laid the foundation of one of PC gaming's most beloved franchises. To get us started, let's quickly go over the game's backstory and introduction. It helps to get a running start. You play as Gordon Freeman, a research associate working in the Anomalous Materials Department at the Black Mesa Research Facility. A man who simply cannot understand how to use a ladder. Fuck. Fuck. I refuse to accept that the problem lies in my perfectly adequate gaming skills. Anyway, our protagonist and his fellow scientists at Black Mesa conduct shady, government-funded experiments in a repurposed ICBM launch facility. The massive, self-sustaining complex houses not only the researchers, but also the security staff, administration, and their families. Due to the limitations of hardware at the time, you don't see very many unique NPCs in the game itself, so you wouldn't be out of place thinking Black Mesa had a small workforce. In fact, the majority of the lore out there about Half-Life, before the Orange Box reawakened interest in the series, came from three spin-off games that Valve didn't even fully develop. Blue Shift, Opposing Force, and the never-to-be-released Half-Life Decay. With that in mind, Let's quickly go over what you need to know about Black Mesa and some of the important characters we'll meet as we blast our way through its halls. Established sometime in the 1950s, we are introduced to this shadowy research conglomerate sometime during the 2000s. The organization's administrator at this time is Wallace Breen, a man who we won't even learn much about until Half-Life 2. Under Breen's direction, Black Mesa made massive improvements in research on teleportation, discovering, likely accidentally, a way to access the alien planet Zin in the process. As one does whenever discovering a new land already inhabited by other intelligent life forms, Black Mesa began plundering Zin for resources at any cost. Specifically useful to Black Mesa's scientific pursuit were Zin crystals, a source of exotic material that has negative mass, which is apparently a thing that may exist. The Zin crystals proved to be valuable energy sources due to the displacement energy they give off, and Black Mesa is actively researching how to harness this energy using an anti-mass spectrometer so that they can use the Zin crystals to power their resource-hungry teleporters. Carrying out that research along with Freeman are some of the brightest minds in the Half-Life universe. Eli Vance, whose daughter Alex is the protagonist of the upcoming Half-Life entry, I'm so excited! works in anomalous materials with Freeman, along with Rosenberg, Bennett, Kleiner, Simmons, Keller, and research associates Green and Cross, who only appear in the spin-off games I mentioned earlier. There are literally no female protagonists in the original Half-Life. It's good to see things have moved forward, I guess. None of these characters are super important to the plot of this game outside of activating some retinal scanners, so we'll move on to the second most important character in this game besides yourself, the G-Man. The G-Man is a fan favorite of the Half-Life universe, and despite a healthy amount of theorizing out there on the internet, he's maintained a shroud of mystery and anonymity over the years. You can catch the G-Man semi-casually observing your actions as you make your way through the game, usually somehow disappearing from your view once noticed. 
I'll direct you to those videos I mentioned in the doobly-doo for more theories about his intentions, but for now, all you need to know is that he's a strange and extremely powerful individual who seems to be thoroughly wrapped up in the events that unfold during the Black Mesa incident. Speaking of which... Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This Valve is big on immersion, and Half-Life's intro sequence definitely shows that off. The game begins as Freeman boards the monorail on his way to the Anomalous Materials Lab. He's running 30 minutes late, allowing him to witness a few interesting scenes this morning, including a guard knocking on the door to the security facilities. That guard, Barney Calhoun, has his own adventure in Blue Shift, later putting him in a position to act as a mole and a major leader for the Resistance in later series installments, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The next oddity worth noting is a large rocket, which may or may not come into play later. We see an Apache either taking off or landing, pass through some chonky security hatches, and we see a sparse character bio pop up on the screen. Subject, Gordon Freeman. Male, age 27. Education, PhD, MIT, theoretical physics. Though I wouldn't be surprised if he minored in tactical combat. For a recent physics grad, Freeman handles his hostile encounters pretty well. His security clearance is level 3, which we don't have much reference for, but we can assume is not very high, and his administrative sponsor is... classified? Hmm. If you've already played the later games, this little guy seems vaguely familiar. Let's see, some more hatches. That's probably not healthy. And finally, Gordon arrives at... Sector C test labs and control facilities. After meandering through the halls and non-canonically stirring up a little trouble, Gordon gets in his HEV suit and heads over to the lab. This is where THE Black Mesa incident occurs. Freeman is to help analyze a new sample this morning, a Zen crystal labeled GG-3883, which the scientists refer to as the purest and most unstable sample yet. We hear that the director went to some great lengths to get it, which totally doesn't raise any red flags. Following instructions like a good little boy, Gordon puts the sample in the spectrometer and, well, this happens. Arguably, Gordon Freeman just doomed humanity with a near-apocalyptic event, so now it's our job, as Gordon, to crawl through the ashes and GTFO. We find out later that the intense displacement energy produced by the exotic matter in the Zen crystal set off a resonance cascade, similar to a nuclear reactor going critical. Only when this happens, instead of causing cancer and melting everything, the so-called displacement energy fuels the formation of portals, creating rifts in reality between Earth and the planet Zen. The next few chapters see our protagonist hopping, climbing, and sliding his way through a series of environmental challenges, with the occasional zombie chicken corpse thrown in for good measure. The plot thickens when the Hazardous Environment Combat Unit, or HECU, arrives to help. Rather than saving lives, it becomes clear that their goal is to silence anything that moves. Gordon works his way through room after room of heavy encampments, foot soldiers, and these fucking turrets! I'm genuinely bad at first-person shooters, like, incomprehensibly bad. Anyway, Gordon goes on a short quest to turn on a test rocket engine in order to kill a big alien thingy, you know, as one does. We get even more shoot 'em up goodness as Gordon eventually fights his way topside. It definitely seems like Half-Life is reinforcing this dynamic that Freeman is the guy who gets things done while everyone else cowers in fear. I've never been a fan of great man history, but at least the game puts effort into canonizing this universe's version of it by having Gordon do basically everything for everyone except open doors that have retinal scanners. At some point, Gordon is told that if he can push his way through the horde of government guns and launch a particular satellite carrying rocket, the Lambda team can activate said satellite and somehow stop the resonance cascade, ending the Zin incursion by extension. This sort of comes out of nowhere, and it's not really explained, but hey, it was the 90s, world building is not what it is now. He makes a great effort to get away after successfully launching the satellite, but after a quick encounter with our only female characters in the game, Gordon gets nabbed and subjected to a precarious Star Wars style trash compactor death. Seriously though, they're like gimp-suited gymnasts on speed. Mm -hmm. 
You know what they say, you either die by the trash compactor or live long enough to see yourself become a waste product jostled around a never-ending system of conveyor belts. After making his way out of this hell factory that exists for some reason, Gordon gets to play with a laser. It becomes clear pretty quickly that the satellite was not successful in closing the portal between Earth and Zinn, so Gordon continues fighting, eventually making his way back to the surface. I don't really have any footage of the fun parts of this level because my version of Half-Life Source was genuinely broken and kept crashing, so we'll just move on. Inexplicably escaping certain doom yet again, Freeman has become more of a nuisance than anything for the HECU, and they begin evacuating their own troops. This is never a good sign. He also has a new goal, get to the Lambda Complex, and use Black Mesa's teleporter to go basically anywhere else. Or at least that's the way it seems to play out in the game itself. The canon reason for Freeman using the Lambda teleporter is to find whatever is keeping the portal between Earth and Zen open and close it for good. Moving through the complex becomes a little easier for Gordon, now that he can mostly focus on his ladder climbing skills, while the remaining HECU soldiers and invading Zen aliens duke it out. Gordon makes it to the Lambda Complex, showing off his sick jump wizard skills with his fancy new long jump module, and reactivating a nuclear reactor which powers the large teleporter. Once the teleporter is activated, Gordon meets a new alien for the first time, the Zin Controller. They are quite obnoxious. These controllers put up a fight, but Freeman pushes on and enters the portal. Arriving in Zinn, a world where everything is a jump puzzle, Gordon is forced to meander through this alien land, quickly learning some lessons about the local ecosystem. He meets a genuine challenge upon meeting the big mama head crab called the Gonarch. Or Gonarch? I'm not sure. Which is probably one of the best descriptive portmanteau names I've ever heard. Dispatching the Gonarch, Freeman does some more jumps. So much jumping. So much falling. He must have legs like freaking telephone poles. Anyway, Gordon is completely silent, but I'm sure at this point he's at least thinking twice before blindly stepping through teleporters. Because he ends up in a facility that reveals the true terror of Zen society. The controllers command hordes of Vortigaunts, these guys, to grow, or manufacture perhaps, the grunts. Some of these Vortigaunts don't even attack Freeman, likely realizing he might be their best chance at freedom. As he makes his way up the corporate ladder, Dear God, no! Again, no more ladders! Gordon comes face to face with the giant floating desiccated alien baby behind the whole operation. The Nihilanth. Or Nihilanth? Look, there's not really a style guide for pronunciations on these things. Fighting with the last of his strength, Freeman breaks through the Nihilanth's protective field and destroys the infantile overlord, presumably closing the portal to Earth. Though Gordon isn't given the time to stick around or even to find a way back home, as he's teleported away from the scene by the mysterious G-Man. Rather than break this scene down for you, here it is in its entirety because it is too iconic a moment in gaming history for you to miss. Gordon Freeman in the flesh, or rather in the hazard suit, I took the liberty of relieving you of your weapons. Most of them were government property. As for the suit, I think you've earned it. The border world, Zen, is in our control for the time being, thanks to you. Quite a nasty piece of work you managed over there. I am impressed. That's why I'm here, Mr. Freeman. I have recommended your services to my uh, employers, and they have authorized me to offer you a job. They agree with me that you have limitless potential. You've proved yourself a decisive man, so I don't expect you'll have any trouble deciding what to do. If you're interested, just step into the portal, and I will take that as a yes. Otherwise, well, I can offer you a battle you have no chance of winning. Rather an anticlimax after what you've just survived. 
time to choose. I am so excited to play through Half-Life 2 again now. I'll try to have the overview for that game up as soon as I can. Obviously, I started the series a bit late to have all four main titles wrapped up before Half-Life Alex releases, but I'll do overviews for each of them regardless. Just writing the script for this was a fun break from my usual stuff, so if you liked this, let me know in the comments what games I should cover in the future. If you want to know more about the Half-Life universe, I would recommend the fantastic wiki over on Fandom. That was a super useful reference when I was gathering my thoughts to write this, so thank you to everyone who's contributed over there, link in the doobly-doo. If you want to see more stuff from me, I've been doing a Let's Play of Pathologic 2, which you should definitely check out. I recently had some computer issues that led to my save file getting lost in the ether because the game doesn't natively support Steam Cloud Save, so we may be restarting that game again sometime soon. Keep an eye out. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to see and hear more stuff like this from me. Leave a like or a dislike or whatever. Have a fantastic whatever day it is. Until next time, I love you. Bye.